after. This morning I began a series of teaching which I intend to take 12 months to complete on miracles, the miracles of Jesus. I need you to understand one thing. When we talk about the miracles of Jesus, whatever manifests among us is still the miracles of Jesus. It has nothing very particularly to do with us, but everything to do with his great love and his great power. And I'm glad that uh, they chose that song just to uh, finish off their session of worship. The water you turned into wine, you opened the eyes of the blind, there is no one like you. And before I kind of get into what I want to say tonight, I was just prompted by the Lord just to I'll just put something down in my notes here. Um, you know, very often you hear of people saying, well, I've got the gift of healing or God's given me the gift of prophecy. And they wield that around as if it's some kind of uh, merit badge. You know, when you're in the scouts, you collect your badges. Well, you know, I'm in the church and I've collected prophecy. And I do a bit of tongues and occasionally if I pray for somebody, they get well. That's as stupid as, you know, as the hammer saying, I completed the work on that fence. You know, they are just tools that God puts into our hands. And as we are obedient with what he places in our hands, that's when the miracles start to happen. It's got really got nothing to do with the fact that I have the gift of healing. The, but the Holy Spirit distributes among us as he will his gifts. But as we take those gifts and we use them, just like tools in a toolbox... That's when God begins to do something. The second we start to think it's about us and about what we own and about what we can do, that's when we start to move into error. And that's why there are a lot of people worshipping so-called evangelists who see them as great power gifts. They go, oh, he's got a great power gift. That man has not got a power gift. The gift that he's been given to me is by the Holy Spirit, but the power comes right from God. It's God's anointing and God's blessing upon their lives. And you know what? God wants to use each and every one of us just that way. And so we just need to get that into our minds. Because I don't want you running away with a thought here that this has anything to do with us whipping up anything or making anything happen. You know what? We can't save anybody. We can't heal anybody. We can't deliver anybody. But by the grace of God, as we use the gifts that God has imparted to us and through us, things begin to happen. So I just want to do that as a little precursor. I just felt that I needed to to say that because when you say you're going to talk about miracles everybody gets this idea that oh we're going to go wacky listen this is the bible here this is the life of jesus i dare you for one month to read nothing else in your bible but the gospels and by the end of it you'll be absolutely and totally convinced this is the will of god that jesus walked out for us exactly how he wants us to live that's why they keep calling him rabbi and teacher it wasn't just the words that he spoke it was the actions to which he delivered the plan and purpose of god into the earth. So we're going to uh, put the scripture up for me, will you, Josh? We're going to bring out, read our second one together. So as we did this morning, we're going to read the scriptures together every time I preach uh, on the miracles. So would you stand with me and we're going to read the scriptures together. Um, okay. After the two days... Yeah, please take your seats. Right there at the beginning of that uh, discourse, John, um, it's amazing actually, let me, let me preamble that one a little bit. I'm so grateful that the Lord revealed himself through four Gospels. And we see Jesus in a different light in every one of the Gospels, and that's in the Bible study series all of its own. Um, and as I said to you this morning, you'll see in the book of Mark the word immediately used 40 times plus. Because Mark wants us to see that Jesus was quick to obey when his father spoke, that he was quick to jump out and to be obedient as the Lord anointed him and touched him and prompted him to minister to certain people. And um, here in, in uh, John's Gospel, John is, is talking to us. Uh, if, if Matthew, Mark and Luke are the camera angles, John's the bit of the script. It kind of all fits together, so you need to read them all. And where we come to some of the miracles where it overlaps in two or three Gospels, we're going to read each of the accounts, because each of the accounts has got something to say. So as he's uh, writing... Um, the discourse. John um, tells us that Jesus is having problems getting people in faith. He says a prophet's not got any honour in his own town. You know, it's easy to get people to moan, isn't it? Really easy. It's get really easy to get people to groan. 
it's really easy to get people to tell you about their problems. You know, you don't have to be a genius to do any of those things. You ask somebody how they are and just watch it happen. You know, people just spill out their insides and tell you how bad things are. But it's incredibly difficult, and Jesus himself found it difficult, to get people into a position of faith. And that's why we are going through these miracles of Jesus, because I want you to get faith, the faith that comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And uh, we need just to lay this out right at the beginning, that God's word stirs our faith. And so very often we just like the good old moan and groan. Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honour in his own country. You know what they say, don't you? That familiarity breeds contempt. And actually, you know what? They didn't view Jesus as being much. Many of them saw him as the illegitimate son of a carpenter. From that rough place called Nazareth. It was like the equivalent of tip to nothing, Nazareth. <laughs> Something like that, anyway. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, okay. Cosily, all right. <laughs> Whatever. But it was a rough place. Stop before I dug myself any further, I know. And it was a rough place. And even, even though the, the same was, does any good thing come out of Nazareth? It was one of them kind of places. But the lesson we need to learn here is that we need to have faith in God rather than faith in the vessel that God is using. Now, we know that Jesus was the perfect son of God. But you know what? I've, I've often said this to people, that perception is 100% of reality. If you, if you believe that Jesus is the son of God, then, you know, you do. And, but these, some of these people didn't believe he was the son of God, didn't even be, believed he was the son of Joseph, that this marriage had been a sham, that this was a illegitimate marriage, that this, all this stuff was going on that shouldn't have gone on. And some of these people really had no time for Jesus or his ministry or anything else that was going on. They looked at the vessel. Instead of seeing what God was doing through him, now we know he was the perfect son of God, but they perceived somehow that he wasn't, that he was something different. And, uh, but I want you to know that Jesus was perfect and um, he was the spotless son of God and he always pointed to the Father. And you know, any miracle that happens, anybody that God works through, you know what we're looking for here? It's always the glory and the honour and the credit to go to the Father. Because actually, it's got nothing to do with us. And as I was meditating on this this afternoon, that thought again came to me that actually Jesus is operating as a man under the anointing of the Holy Spirit so, you know, he's, he's doing just like what we're doing. It wouldn't have been fair if Jesus had been retained all his godly um, attributes and stuff. The Bible says that he gave all of that away. You know, we used to talk about the condescension at Christmas time when Jesus came down from earth to heaven and he confined himself to the physical and mental and social barriers that we find ourselves in. All of that stuff Jesus did. But as that, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, listening to the voice of his Father, he begins to show his disciples that God wants his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, and miracles begin to flow. Jesus hasn't modelled something for us in the Gospels that is impossible for us to do. We really need to hold on to that thought. And Jesus always used these kinds of words. I read them this morning, but they're, bur they're worth repeating. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. What Jesus is saying, he says, what you're seeing here, as this blind eye is open, what you're seeing here as this cripple is jumping out, this, this, is, this is not me, this is the work of God through me. I've come to do his will. Don't you for a second think that Jesus had any additional superpowers somehow that would have made it unfair if Jesus has told us that we were going to do what he was going to do and greater things which we'll read a little bit later on then for him to have done that and have some kind of secret power would not be fair but as his disciples he has promised us that we'll do greater things and he told us not to worry because he was going away not to worry because the miracle shouldn't stop and the blessing shouldn't stop and salvation shouldn't stop because what he was going to do, and Steve uh, preached this not long back, 
is that in the Acts of the Apostles, when the Holy Spirit came, he came to indwell his church that we might be like Jesus in the earth. And when the enemy crucified him on Calvary, what he didn't realise is that he was going to raise up a whole band just like him to go out into all the world and to take the gospel. The trouble is we've become too religious and too insular. In John also it says then, you shall know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father has taught me, I speak these things. I always do the things that please him. So what I want to say is don't look at the person praying for you if you ask somebody to pray for you. Look at the God who's working through them. Because many times people have missed their healing and their miracle because they were looking for somebody's hand instead of seeking his face. It happens all the time. I will guarantee you. I will guarantee you if you were in a big conference tonight and the preacher was on the platform and we know that he was kind of a big name. You know what? If he called forward an altar call, if he come to pray for you because you were poorly, you'd be really happy. But if you got one of his team who you didn't know who it was, who looked insignificant, and like they didn't know what they were doing, you'd be miffed. I think we just missed the point. We just missed the point. It's not about the who. It's about the who. It's not about seeking someone's hand. It's about seeking his face. Because this has nothing to do with us apart from our obedience and our faith towards God, but this has everything to do with God's gracious, loving kindness towards humanity in that he would use us anyway. You know, Mr. Big and Pastor Large from the mega church, they have no more authority as a believer than you do. Jesus didn't make a differential when he gave the Great Commission. He didn't say, I want the Ephesians 4 giftings to go into all the world and preach the gospel and lay hands on the sick and cast out demons, and do all the things that God commanded us to do. He didn't say, oh, the apostles and the prophets and the pastors and teachers and evangelists can do that, and everybody else can come to church and just sing the songs and put the money in. didn't say that. There's an emphasis there in the scripture that every single blood-washed, born-again believer should have the authority that has been given. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me both in heaven and earth. Now I'm going to give it to you, and you are going to go out and make disciples of all nations. And as we found recently with one or two people that we started to lead to the Lord, it's going to take more than one of us to disciple them. It's going to take a team. But God is working through us. But never, ever put the emphasis on the person that's praying for you here. You know, if, 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 you're not, if I don't pray for you, don't, don't worry about it. I say, well, there's only so-and-so that prayed for me. Who cares? Your faith should be in God, not in them. That's been the problem. And we've had, that's why we've had people, not people don't come forward for prayer. Oh, I ain't going forward. I mean, be careful who lays hands on you. The Bible does tell you that. You know, you don't want some complete and utter idiot laying hands on you. And we'll make sure that doesn't happen in this church. Because, <laughs> you know what? When you lay hands on somebody, there's an impartation. Believe you me, it's a spiritual principle. But, you know, what? we are trusting God, you know, that as we leap out in faith, all of us can be used to God. Because yeah, I can't be where you are tomorrow morning. I have some stuff to do. No doubt I will end up praying for somebody. I prayed for several people in the meeting this morning and outside of the meeting. I will end up praying for somebody tomorrow. I've got a funeral visit tomorrow night. I will bet my bottom dollar I'll end up praying with somebody. But I, you can't be where I am and I can't be where you are. You need to be the hands and feet of Jesus into your place of work and community and where you live. And so I'm imploring you, this is not about the who, it's about you. You need to get hold of God, take the tools that he's given us and go out and preach the gospel and let's really reach people. The scripture tells this story then. There was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When the man heard Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and to heal his son. He was close to death. This man had made a journey. He'd made a pilgrimage, if for want of a better word. And uh, we see his faith. And uh, faith is often demonstrated by our pursuit i use this scripture this morning and i often use it draw near to god and he will draw near to you it's in the pursuit of god that he pursues us and this man has got an issue his son's poorly see 
he decided that he was going to take a journey of faith. And sometimes it's like that. If we're needing an answer to our prayers, sometimes they are not instantaneous. Thank God for the times he is instant. Thank times for the quicklies and the suddenlies of the Bible. But there are times when we have to intercede and fight. And I'm off my subject completely now, but I've been ambushed by the Holy Spirit again. One of the other things I said to the prayer meeting on Wednesday, God drew this dramatically to my attention, is that the answers to many of our prayers are already on the way. They have left heaven. You want to read the book of Daniel? When God says to him, Daniel, don't you worry, because the first time that you cried to me, the first time you prayed, I heard you. And the message, the answer is on its way. The problem is there's a bit of a battle going on up there that you didn't see with your natural eyes, but I can guarantee you this. The message is on its way. The answer is on its way. And some of us need to see that, you know, some things don't happen instantaneously, but it's not that God didn't hear us. And some of you need to keep on praying and keep on praying because the answer is on the way. It's on the way. But apathy will cause you to sit and moan, but it's faith that stirs us to action. God can heal you in your chair. But most of the time, well, in fact, all of the time, I dare you to read the gospel narrative. So it's not me that's upsetting you now, it's the Bible, which is great. You know, I need the Bible to stir us. But the people who got healed by Jesus, I want you to notice one thing. None of them were passive. All of them made an attempt to get to Jesus. Every one of them cried out after him or, or made an attempt to say, God help me, Jesus help me. They walked some miles, they grabbed his coat, they touched the hem of his garment, they pursued him, and in the pursuit, Jesus met them. Not in their apathy. And I said this morning, and it, it seems to go against the religious grain, God does not respond to our misery, he doesn't even respond to our hurt. God responds to our faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So this man was just a, he was a royal official. He's part of the court. So he's a man with some kind of authority. He understood he was a leader. This is a big thing for him. He's taking a real step of faith because actually, you know, as we've seen with uh, the woman with the issue of blood, or we will see with the woman with the issue of blood, but I've preached on it before. For her to actually break cover because of her condition and because of her uncleanness and to and to throw herself at the, and to touch the hem of Jesus' garment in front of Jairus, who was the synagogue official, he could have had the right to stone that woman to death. But her faith propelled her to pursue Jesus. And just in the same way, this, this guy here, he's got authority. He's well known. Everybody knows his face. He's part of the, the leadership of the country. And he makes a pilgrimage towards Jesus. God, you know, he's no respecter of persons. And um, you will hear repeatedly through the gospel narratives, and every time I read it, words like this, be unto you according to your faith. Your faith has made you whole. And this royal official, he comes to Jesus, and here's his request, sir, come down before my child dies. This man's making a faith confession, because what he's saying actually is, my son's dying, there's no answer to this apart from you coming. He didn't, he didn't say, well, you know, Jesus, I've, I've come, we'll, we'll, give it a, we'll give it a go. You know, we've got the doctor coming as well. You know, if you'll come, if the doctor comes, see, see which one wins. You know, he, he said, Jesus, you know, my son's dying. This kid, he's gone unless you turn up. And the desperation of his faith begins to draw upon the living God. And um, Jesus says to him, go, your son will live. I want you to notice that this official took Jesus as his word. And here is an incredibly strong principle that you'll see again throughout the gospel narratives. We need to take Jesus as his word. Not at our experience, but it is his word. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, Therefore I tell you, whenever you ask in prayer, believe that you receive it, and it will be yours. This man just didn't ask in faith. He responded once the word of God came back. 
and he took the journey back home. He believed that he'd already received it. He took Jesus to his word. Why would he? If he knew the only answer was Jesus, and Jesus said, it's done now, you go back home. You know, he didn't hang around Jesus, you know, for the next 20, 30 minutes. He got back on his donkey or horse or whatever he came on with his entourage potentially, and he went back home because he took Jesus at his word. His faith was in what Jesus had said rather than the circumstances that he could see. The last time he saw his son, he was on his deathbed. There was nothing in, his, in the natural through his eyes, his ears, or anything else for him to understand that his son had got any better. So really, naturally speaking, he took a huge leap of faith as he turned his back then on Jesus and he walked back and rode back to where he had to go back home to. But Hebrews tells us, doesn't it, that we walk by faith and not by sight. And I guess every step back home, he was thinking, I wonder if, he's, I wonder if that son of mine's dead. But Jesus said, he'd be all right. And sometimes we, we wane, don't we? And uh, I, I love that scripture, I do believe, just help my unbelief. I think sometimes we get into that place. But this guy, was, he was determined, he was going back. And then the scripture says, while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired at the time when his son got better, he said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time which Jesus said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This is the second miracle in Cana of Galilee. And again, we see, as we saw the principles this morning, it was instigated by faith, the faith of a man who was desperate. And then Jesus spoke a word. We heard that again this morning. Jesus spoke a very specific word, as he did in Cana in Galilee. And then this man took Jesus at his word, and then Jesus did exactly what he'd promised to do. The problem is sometimes... We don't always take Jesus at his word. Or we've got, as I said to you this morning, a whole religious mindset about how this is going to work. I don't know about you, have you ever asked God for something and then tried to work out how he's going to do it for you? You don't have to do that, he's God. He's got a million ways of meeting your need or coming to you. But the problem with, with our natural mind, we want to try and say, well, if God just did this, this and this, then that would happen and it will all be all right. But God doesn't work that way. Have you noticed? God has got a thousand ways of doing what God does. And um, the problem is sometimes, you know, that we just want Jesus to do the, the, the way that we want Jesus to do it. And that man could have hung around instead of going home and trusting Jesus. He could have hung around and said, Jesus, I want you to come with me. I don't want to go on my own. It needs you. It needs you to turn up, Jesus. I want you to come to my house. And if you could rebuke the devil, that'd be good. And if you could lay your hands on him, that would be better. And if you could shake a little bit, that would mean you were really charismatic. And then if you could speak in tongues, that would be great. That'd be re- that, you know, that then, then our faith level would rise and there'd definitely be a miracle if you turned up to do that. Isn't it strange how we've got Jesus boxed up instead of just believing him? And I, said, I, I gave you just a little taste of this this morning, but I want to read to you from 2 Kings and chapter 5. It's when Naaman, leprous, full of leprosy, hears that there's a man of God, a prophet of God, that can speak a word. And uh, he makes the pilgrimage again, faith in the pursuit. He goes to find the man of God. And uh, the man of God tells him that he's going to go and dip in the Jordan. And he just can't get his head around it. It doesn't seem right to him. And this, this, sounds like a, this sounds like it's from the God channel, this doesn't it? But Naaman was very angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his God. I thought he would wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not the rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel? Couldn't I be washed and be cleansed in them? So he turned away and went off in a rage. Man! He didn't like it because the pastor didn't pray for him. The man of God didn't come out. He stopped in his house, just sent the word. Listen, it's God's word that we need to trust. 
not what somebody can do physically for us. Now, we believe in laying hands of hands. That's part of our heritage as a Pentecostal church. We believe in praying for the sick. Of course we do. But I tell you what, one word from Jesus will change absolutely everything. But we have to believe his word. It's not trying to put him in some kind of box and say, well, if we get out here and, and they call for the elders of the church and oh, they all lay hands on me and they shake a little bit. Now, listen, we need to trust God. The, the, what we're talking about here in terms of miracles is the supernatural. I don't know about you, I've never walked on water. I, I, I've never raised anybody from the dead. I'm just a normal bloke. And we need God to equip us. That Those things that the scriptures talk about that Jesus did come under the anointing of the Holy Spirit because he's, he was obedient to his father and always listening to his father. We need to get that deep into our hearts somehow. Because the problem, and I will tell you this right now, the problem of the church in our generation is that we think that we can do it. We think that it's all right if we can pack the church out with enough people and preach down a watered-down gospel and get a few people to pick up their hands and say that they want to follow Jesus, then we're getting it all right. Listen, we have missed it by a million miles. We have got to get so much in faith towards Jesus and allow him to be the total centre of everything that we base everything that we do on. It's got nothing to do with what I can do. It's got everything to do with what Jesus can do through me and through you as well. Forget the vessel. Look to the master. He got really upset, Naaman did, because the prophet wouldn't come out. Got nothing to do with the prophet. The prophet had heard from God that he delivered the word of God. When Naaman believed that on the word of God that was delivered to him, he was completely and utterly made well. Didn't need the prophet to come out and wave his hand and shabadabadoo or whatever. <laughs> God does not follow your process. We respond in faith to God, and God does what God does. Amen. And that is it. And by the time I've got through 29 of these miracles, you'll say, Steve, is that all that it is? I have nothing else to say. We pursue God with all of our hearts, and we allow God to do what we cannot do. Bev said to me this morning, we were talking about some stuff. She said, you know what? Jesus is all I've got and all I need. And it's absolutely true. There is nothing else that can change our lives and our situation. And by Lord, we've tried many other things, many of us. It would be far easier to be like the world. But look, we, once we've encountered Jesus, you know there is no going back. But the church has forgotten all about it because we've organised ourselves. We're well organised. We're, we're great. We can run things. But we're powerless. And we're not seeing what God wants us to see. And when he tells us that we're going to do greater things than him, none of us have. So either the Bible's lying or we're failing. I'll put my money on the Bible being right. I want to tell you over these next few months, this next 12 months, every time I stand to preach, we'll probably read the scriptures because I think that's important. The Bible talks about the public reading of the Bible. I know I'll preach about Jesus and about what he alone can do. I know I'll preach faith and trust in him. And so I listen, any meeting that you see my name down on the, on the diary, you can bring unsafe people to, because we're going to preach the gospel. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. It's all about Jesus. It's not come, come to church and it'll all be better. I've been to church, it's all worse, I'll tell you. Do you know what I'm saying? If you're trusting in this church, you're trusting the wrong thing. My hope is fixed on nothing less. On Jesus' blood and righteousness. Now, as we've seen this story, it's been a simple story. Man comes in faith. Jesus responds. Man responds in faith. Healing occurs. I don't know about you, but I know when you read the Bible, you kind of put yourself in the Bible stories. Perhaps I'm just odd. Anybody been there? Like imagining you were David and seeing Goliath, looking up at him. Or maybe just imagine you were Gideon beating out wheat in the wine press and an angel shows up and you nearly wet yourself and go, oh, I'm a valiant warrior. 
I don't know, it's just me. I just kind of, you know, you, you read the Bible stories. I like to kind of get my mind involved with, you know, I wonder what it was like there, you know. I wonder what happened then. And when we get to heaven, we'll get to see all of those events. I am sure it'll be fantastic just to see them all in multicolour. But I want you tonight, and this might sound like heresy, but it's not heresy. If you imagine the story tonight, where do you imagine yourself? I think most of us would put ourselves in the place of the, the nobleman. That we're in need and we need a word. And that's how many of us always come to church. We're in need, we need a word. That's, that's the way the church is right now. All across the globe. It's very much about me and about my need, about what I want. But you know what? I think sometimes Jesus said that we do what he did. And maybe we just need to change positions and put ourselves in the place of doing the works of Jesus and seeing people come to us and having faith not in us but in the God that we serve and us speaking a word in faith and seeing the miraculous poured out. And if you think this is heresy, let me just read it. It's in the red. You've got one of them Bibles. It's got red bits. That's what Jesus said. You know, you can take that to the bank, can't you? In the red... John 14, 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do greater, even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Now, I, I don't think you can make that verse say anything than it already says. You know, some preachers take a verse and kind of mess it around and get you wondering whether they actually said what it really says. I think Jesus meant what he said there, that we were supposed to do the stuff that we read in the gospel narratives because he wasn't here to do them anymore because he's gone to fulfill an incredible, powerful job. One, he laid his blood on the altar for us and brought our salvation. Thanks be to God, he's in heaven this morning, uh, this evening, and there's, a, there's real blood on a real altar. And every time that Jesus looks at the blood, he cries mercy over us. And his father cries mercy over us. And the Holy Spirit brings us peace. But not only does he go and he puts the sacrifice on the heavenly altar. The Bible says he stands right now and he's praying for us. What do you think he's praying for? He's praying that we win. He's praying that we do what he's done. He's praying that we all take the gospel and get on with the job. I said to you this morning, we can hasten the coming of Jesus. We just need to preach the gospel. So it's a testimony in the old end, until the ends of the earth. And you know what then the scripture says? Then the end will come. Well, there's a war and the rumor of war. Well, there's always been wars and rumors of wars. But the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. What's that? That his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. That what they're experiencing before the throne of God right now. There's no sickness in heaven, no disease, no turmoil. As, as um, uh, Shirley often says, there's no panic in heaven. The angels are not worrying wor around, scratching their heads bald to say, oh, well, what's happening? What's happening? They know that God has got it all in control. And here, verily I tell you, whatever, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and they will do even greater things because I go to the Father. Jesus is praying over his church tonight that we wake up with some kind of sleeping joint, you know, the church. The, the, I'm just trying to be as honest as I possibly can and I'm searching my own soul, but I, I think that the charismatic church has made the miraculous a kind of a sideshow. And then the more thoughtful and theological among our among the church, I'm talking about the church globally now. I've seen that as a bit of a red herring. Listen, both true. We need to see the power of God move among us, but only in, in the light of what God has said in his word. And that we need to be people who are full of truth. And you know, the Bible says that they overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. We need to know whose we are. 
again, I was just thinking uh, today, you know, very often we talk about people making decisions for Christ. I'm frustrated that we're not seeing some conversions. Do you know what I'm saying? It, 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 it's not too bad to get somebody to acknowledge the fact that maybe they're a sinner and they need God. Most people, if you talk to them on any kind of level, would probably admit to that. But what we want to see is people are so convicted of their sin, they cry out unto a mighty God and they pass from death to life. That is the gospel that we need to be preaching. Not come down here and put your hand up. You know. The trouble is people come into church and they learn the they learn the ropes, don't they? They learn the lingo. It's like the kid in the Sunday school. And his Sunday school teacher was asking him a question asking questions. And they always seem to have religious answers. But the Sunday school teacher decided she'd throw a few secular questions in there just to spice it up a little bit, keep the kids on their toes. And uh, the kid says, uh, the, the teacher says, uh, he says, Roger de Courcy has got a bear, a ventriloquist dummy, bear. What's his name? And the little kid puts his hand up and he says, I know it's Nookie, but the answer's obviously Jesus. <laughs> We've got people to that almost so they know what to say we need the holy spirit to give it people and they run to this altar and, and and this is why i'm preaching what i am preaching and i make no compromise on it we are going to preach the gospel for the next 12 months we're going to preach the gospel that jesus walked out on this earth as he forgave sins and he healed the sick and he raised the dead and he cleansed the lepers and he proclaimed the kingdom of god in all its fullness and he looks at his disciples and he said, that's what I want you to do as well. I want you to come and I want you to follow me. He didn't want them to follow him so they've got their TV cameras. Or they could scribble down stuff so they could write his book so he could sell it. He wanted them to follow him so they could do what he was doing. He was the rabbi. He wanted them to teach, teach them what, what it was to walk for God and live for God. And so tonight, I just want to say as a church, let's believe God. Let's have some faith and let's start to believe that God through you and through me can do the supernatural. Not because we're anything special, but because he's almighty God. And there's none like him. He sits on the circle of the earth. He flung the stars into space. He created all things by the power of his word. He sustains this world by the power of his word. There is none like him. And by his spirit, he lives in us. And he wants us to change this sin-sick world. That is the core of the gospel. It always has been. It's not about the decisions of one or two. Our God intended community transformations. He, de he declared, and it will happen one day, that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, would you just anoint us with your spirit? Would you stir us to get some faith towards you? Would you help us when we just bump into people in the street to be Christians, to do what we're supposed to do, to tell them about you, to lay our hands on them, to ask if we can pray, to share our faith, to leap forward, to be quick with the gospel, to be quick with prayer, that, Father, that you might use us and that your supernatural power would just endure, endure us not for our glory and for our honour, but that, that, that as we read, as this man went home, all of his household believed because of what you had done. Lord, we want to see households saved. We want this community to be transformed. In the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.